Welcome everyone. I'm Gina Grillo, president of the Advertising Club of New York. I hope everybody is getting along given all the changes to our daily life. But please be assured that the Advertising Club and the Andy Awards are committed to keeping our community together and keeping us all connected even while we're distanced. We have literally transformed the club into a virtual clubhouse, providing our members online resources to help navigate these times. Today's webinar is a collaboration with Perksy, a corporate member who came to us with a content idea that was both thoughtful and timely. They see the club as a platform and as a community to tap into, and we hope that this conversation sparks more collaborations with our members. And this is so exciting. We have a lot of people tuning in close to 500, so let's get to the content. It is my pleasure to introduce Nadia Mastry, founder and CEO, and Jamie Pete, Senior Vice President of Client Partnerships at Persky. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, we're so excited to be here today. Hey, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. My name is Nadia. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Perksy based here in New York, and I guess technically based out of my apartment right now. Um, I'm sure you're all in a very similar position. Uh, Perksy is a next-gen consumer insights platform. We power real-time research with everyday consumers uh, with a focus on millennial and Gen Z, which we're gonna be talking about today. And we do that through a mobile app. Uh, so we help brands better understand their audiences, conduct research in real time with everything from ad testing, pack and concept testing, um, testing out new creative, doing consumer research. And we're very excited to share with you today some of the research that we have done. We work with clients uh, like various ad agencies and agency networks um, and Fortune 500 brands like Pepsi, Smuckers, Clorox, Colgate, Nickelodeon, Target, the list goes on. So if you have any questions after, you're more than welcome to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we're also happy to share any more of our research um, with every single one of you. Um, so I will now pass the baton to Jamie, who can introduce himself and share a bit more about Perksy and what led us to run this research. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Nadia. I'm going to share my screen. Great. So we're really excited about this partnership opportunity with Ad Club. Um, we think that we're uniquely positioned to get millennial and Gen Z feedback, uh, having solved a lot of longstanding engagement issues in the market research world. Uh, response rates have been declining for a long time. Uh, and really, we took a fresh look at how to do things and have addressed a lot of these issues, such as shorter surveys, uh, more engaging process and engaging content. Um, um, uh, a better reward system, sorry, offering people choice and an amazing mobile experience. So uh, all of these have led to really high response rates for us in the industry. Uh, and that's a, a really a step change in how people are getting feedback from brands these days. Uh, I'm going to walk into the research and quickly just state some of the objectives uh, of this to, to kick things off. Um, wanted to just give a, a quick current state of the nation to start off for millennials and Gen Z, <clears throat> talking about the current economic environment, some of uh, what their concerns are and what they're looking forward to coming out of this pandemic. Also understanding changes in consumer behavior since the pandemic began. Obviously, we're getting a lot of questions from brands on brand switching, uh, how much of this behavior is permanent versus long lasting uh, or temporary and looking for some of those indicators on, on whether that will be the case. Certainly there's no crystal ball, uh, but definitely if we keep tabs on what people are doing and what they're thinking, uh, we can hopefully understand uh, how to address this challenge coming out of, out of these uncertain times. And also understand what consumers want from brands during this period. We ask questions about messaging uh, and what they want to hear from brands during this time. So really quickly, some key points that I'll highlight to kick off the discussion. Um, there are a lot of new activities started by consumers since the pandemic began. And this provides brands with more channels to reach more people. We'll get into the details when we get into the data. <clears throat> Nearly two thirds of millennials and Gen Z have been buying different brands since the pandemic began. So there's brand switching happening. Uh, we knew there's a variety of reasons for this and we'll get into some of those details as well. Some of them are definitely availability driven. Others maybe have longer lasting implications. There are some indicators uh, that behavior changes could last beyond the time of crisis. Again, um, 
we all want a, a, a look into the future, um, but we'll have to operate with current data based as well, maybe with some understanding of what's happened in the past and, and downturns prior to uh, what we're dealing with now. Millennials and Gen Z do want brands to continue communicating with them during this time, and they'd like them to participate in the discussion surrounding COVID-19. So that's not something that brands should, should shy away from, uh, and we'll get into some of what they want to hear. Uh, there are a variety of messages that could work for brands in maintaining a dialogue with their customers uh, during this crisis. Some really quick information on the details for the study. Uh, we fielded April 9th and got it, that was Thursday, got out of field Friday. Uh, we interviewed a thousand Gen Z and millennial Americans, 50-50 uh, gender split and virtually 50-50 Gen Z and millennial split as well. So I think in order to understand uh, how to address a challenge, we need to be crystal clear on the context. Uh, and that's, that's really helpful. Our data is showing that nearly half of millennial and Gen Z consumers are dealing with some form of compromised employment or salary conditions, whether that be they've been laid off, had hours reduced, been furloughed, or had their salary reduced. Um, just bringing in some additional data to add to this, um, if we look back at 2008 and 2009, the peak unemployment claims in the United States hit about 665,000 for the week ending March 28th. For the week ending March 28th, this time around, we're at 10 times that number at 6.6 .6 million. Uh, and it's really, I think, important to understand what people are going through and, and as a result, what types of activities, behaviors, attitudes will change uh, during a time like this. One of the first questions we asked was what people are concerned about after this has passed. Uh, economic concerns definitely lead, lead the way there. So I've netted a number of the responses throughout. So you'll see a dark bar around the net value. So that's a net of economic recovery. My favorite business is reopening, finding a new job, keeping my job. So every time you see that dark bar, it's a net of the responses immediately under it. Tried to color code that to make it more clear. And that'll be a pattern you'll see throughout the deck today. Uh, in addition to these economic concerns, there are social concerns that have that people have with reconnecting with friends and family, reestablishing a work routine, and also some serious concerns with at least half of people saying, well, what if this comes back or a new pandemic starting? And then to round things out, there are personal finances, of course, that are being savings are being depleted during this time. People are incurring debts during these times. And you know, I don't think we've seen uh, the peak impact of that happening either. There is a skew towards millennials for concerns around repaying debt. Obviously, they're at a later stage in life and probably have more debt and more potential dependence to support. <clears throat> On the flip side, what are people most looking forward to? Um, socializing again and seeing their friends and family and colleagues uh, leads the way, 84% saying one of those uh, desires. This kind of leads right into the entertainment aspect as well, because these are all social activities, uh, such as eating out at restaurants, going to movies, uh, going to concerts, uh, attending sp professional sport venues. After that, we've got just a more general, please let me get out of my house. Uh, I'd like to go for a walk or a hike uh, and just stop. I don't want to keep on worrying. So I don't want to worry about my loved ones or myself in terms of catching the, the disease. Uh, and just general stress uh, activities. And I'd like to move my physical activity back outside the home uh, to where I usually do it. So what are the types of things that people have started since the pandemic? So we asked a few questions, started doing more of, and what do you think you'll continue? I'm gonna focus on the, the new activities here. Um, recreational is definitely one way that people are really trying to op occupy their time. So I'm sure we've all seen news around the, the increased gaming. Playing new video games uh, is 46% uh, of people saying that they've started doing that, as well as board games, playing cards and puzzles. There's also social activities such as an increase in video chatting with friends and family, uh, as well as posting on new social media platforms. So again, maybe some different channels or more channels to reach more people as more people enter these areas uh, during these times for brands to get a hold of them. Also, people are taking the opportunity to learn new things. So taking online classes, learning new skills such as coding, video editing, et cetera, or learning a new language. And definitely exercise has moved indoors. So uh, we're seeing Peloton uh, do really, really well, having trouble keeping up with su supply there or demand, uh, as well as just general, generally it's very hard to get a hold of exercise equipment. So a lot of people trying to stay fit in a new environment also, cooking and, and uh, artistic activities have really picked up as well as new activities people are engaging with. There's not a lot of uh, generational differences with this data. I did pull out some, some gender differences, though. Uh, guys are kind of leading the way in terms of playing new video games, but still a lot of females engaged in that as well at 56%, 70% for males. 
Uh, if we look at the social aspect, it's really uh, women driving the increase in video chatting with friends and family versus, versus guys. Uh, that, the net overall is 63 versus 50, but the difference is larger even with uh, video chatting specifically. We're also seeing a gender skew for, uh, in terms of females for things like cooking, uh, new recipes, et cetera, as well as artistic endeavors, uh, particularly the crafting aspect. I think what's really interesting there too is just bringing up the exercise point. Um, so the fact is the way this question was framed is it, it was asked um, what new activities are folks doing? So I think what's important to really double click on there is that these are, these are new activities to them. So there is a massive increase in exercise and you might say, all right, well, of course exercise is going inside. They can no longer do it outside, but these are new activities that they're engaging in. I think people are focused on these things a little bit more, which I think might speak to some, some uh, desire to not just keep one self entertained, but also there's this uh, trend of self betterment that's going around during this time. I know for myself, um, all this, although this sounds incredibly cheesy, I too was like, I'm going to start painting and I'm going to learn the violin. These are things that I decided to do in the spare time that I have. Thanks, Nadia. Um, we're also seeing that the, the pandemic has really been a catalyst for um, people experimenting with different brands. And again, there's a number of reasons for this, but we're seeing nearly two thirds of, of millennials and Gen Z saying that they're buying some different brands or many different brands during these times. And availability, of course, is a key driver of that. So people saying I'm buying whatever is available when I shop, my normal brands are out of stock, what I normally buy online isn't available. But also, uh, there is increased exposure to uh, a new set of brands for people. So people are browsing more options online, they're buying things online that they didn't used to buy before, and completely new products that they didn't used to buy. So these are the, this is the kind of thing that may uh, impact longer term behavior as well, which is not uh, simply uh, an availability uh, reason for switching. Also from a cost and value perspective, so buying lands, buying brands that are less expensive or buying more store brands, um, we can kind of see what's happened in the past year to help give us some glimpse into, into what might continue and at least to understand it, uh, particularly in each given category will be really interesting to see uh, what your target consumers are doing, the degree to which they've done this, uh, what the value proposition is for them longer term, et cetera. But after the last recession, retailers really focused on store brands to offer consumers a cheaper price. Uh, and many consumers kept buying these brands long after recovery. So um, Target's Cat and Jack line is a good example, uh, reaching $2 billion in sales, as well as Amazon having more than 80 in-house brands themselves across a, a variety of categories at this point, and the fact that they're doing well. Um, finally, thinking, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, I, I also think that like, you know, the fact that after the above, so the availability of usual brands being reported as the, the key reason why consumers are switching brands, and then the, the second being switching to less expensive options, to save money, uh, clocking at number two. I think uh, aside from that, like consumers have reported that the, there is, the fact that they're exploring some of these new options is an opportunity for brands and marketers to really think about product trial during this time, really incentivizing it. I think you know, consumers are looking for new stuff to do. They're looking to pick up new hobbies, learn new skills, try new things. If there's ever been a time to get creative with marketing, if there's ever been a, a time to you know, incentivize new behaviors, now is, is really it. I think brands can leverage this appetite for newness by marketing certain product related activities to consumers. Uh, so, you know, getting them hooked on the latest uh, video game, which just can't be missed and maybe teaching them how to stream it on Twitch, um, which could be exciting for some consumers, maybe sharing some workouts that they can totally crush wearing your your latest performance wear or your brand new sneakers, um, showing them how to bake with a product. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but Triscuits and lasagna is absolute fire. That's a perfect example. Um, I, I would say to just you know give it a go that there, there's never been a time, a better time to, to get really creative with marketing and advertising. Back to you, Jamie. Great, thank you. Uh, also, uh, health and safety aspects. So people are saying that they're buying brands uh, that are healthier and buying things that seem safer to them as well. Cleaning products being a, a good example of that. Um, so 
are brands, are people going to continue buying these brands that they've moved to beyond the recession? So among people that said that they've been doing some switching, 44% are saying that they'll either definitely or probably can continue buying those brands uh, once the, the crisis has passed. And then we've got another 45% that are on the fence. They may or may not, but they're certainly open to that. Uh, and that's something to understand as well. Males are actually even more likely than females to say that they will stick to what they've moved to. Uh, 49% uh, versus 38% for females. I also think that since consumers have reported that their increase in online shopping is actually exposing them to more options and variety, which was a close third after you know, uh, you know, switching to less expensive options and um, availability of usual brands. I, I think that this is a pretty significant insight. I mean, it means that there's a big opportunity for, for companies to, to drive product trial and adoption during this time. So understanding where your customers are making purchase decisions is gonna play a really important role in, in driving that, that product trial and adoption and, and really driving sales for the brand. So thinking, you know, where are they purchasing from? Is it through Target? Is it Walmart? Um, are they ordering through Instacart? Um, how are they really making these purchase decisions and where is this taking place so that you can understand that entire funnel? I think that will be really important because you know, the, the system of purchase has changed or the path to purchase has changed. Also, you know, with what Jamie just said, you know, saying that more than 40% of millennials and Gen Z who have reported they're buying different brands now say that they'll either definitely or probably continue buying these brands after the pandemic has passed. I mean, I mean, dang, that's, that, that's a pretty, that's another really deep insight. And theoretically, this means that, you know, brands who are the, who are successfully converting consumers to product trial during this period stand a really good chance of retaining them as, as customers after, you know, COVID has been weathered and the whole storm has passed. I think that, you know, brand execs should be definitely wary of, of slashing marketing and ad spend while marketers and advertisers don't always have control of that. I think brand execs should definitely be thinking about that at a time when, when consumers are, are bouncing between options. Um, and instead, be, maybe think about uh, ways to in, invest in order to drive that increased customer trial and adoption during this period. Great, thank you. Um, with respect to communications, consumers are looking to brands to talk to them during this time. So 48% of people saying that brands should communicate more during this time uh, across various channels. Another 38% saying that they should at least be communicating the same amount that they did in the past. Uh, that's even more true uh, for Gen Z versus millennials with 53% versus 44% saying that brands should be communicating more during this time. And should we be addressing the current situation. Well, 60% of people are saying that, yes, they want to see messages from brands that address the pandemic. Um, so sure, there's 40% there's saying that don't address it or you know, don't talk to me during this time, but it's a, a strong majority saying that, please engage in the, the discussion around the current environment because they're really they're looking for some help. So one of the key things that consumers want brands to help out with is help me staying, uh, help me make staying at home easier. Either you know, examples of free delivery, keeping how to keep occupied, um, how are you helping customers and employees and reassurance of product availability. So 75% saying something related to that aspect. Um, also, you've got license to talk about healthy behaviors. So there's, there's this altruistic aspect that I think is becoming an expectation uh, from consumers as well to talk about, you know, encourage things like social distancing, get into that. Um, how do you ensure safe and healthy use of your products? Some general unity messages as well, or how, you, how are you helping local communities and businesses? Um, you really have license at this time to get into a more uh, brand love and, and dialogue with your consumers that really builds some trust over time, which the long-term impact of that is, is significant. Um, with respect to uh, generational differences, again, we didn't see a lot of generational differences between millennials and Gen Z for this uh, particular data, but we did see some gender differences once again. So 60% of females versus 41% saying help make staying at home easier. And then another big difference was uh, how you were ensuring safe and healthy use of your products, 45% versus 31% for females versus males. <clears throat> so to wrap up, uh, increased gaming and social media activity provide brands with the ability to reach more consumers now uh, than in the past. Uh, definitely a male skew for gaming and a female skew on the social media aspect. 
brand switching has been widespread during this time. So again, as Nadia said, there are opportunities here that have been developed for brands to, uh, that's trial generating times uh, and definitely maintaining that into the post pandemic era is a big opportunity, but also for others to keep an understanding your category and among your target consumers of what is happening, what are they switching to, what's the value proposition in their minds, what are the perceptions, uh, and what can we do to protect the business. Based on historical downturns combined with some current data, there are indicators that behavior changes could last beyond the time of crisis. So again, that's related to point number two and something to, uh, to understand for your specific business. Brands should definitely get involved in the conversation. Uh, so keep communicating how you can help consumers during these times, both product messages and altruistic messaging around safety and unity are welcome. Uh, so there's, there's more data behind the study, but uh, that was the, what we put together for the time today. And I really appreciate uh, everybody attending and, and your attention. And I'm gonna pass it off to Christina now for the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, I think it's still, sharing your computer screen at this moment. There we go. All right. Um, thanks everyone for, for attending. I'm Christina Monlos. I'm the marketing editor for Digiday and I'm uh, happy to be leading a discussion um, with Nydia and Wanda. Um, Nydia, do you wanna introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm Nydia Serrano. I am the audience marketing director at Pandora, uh, where I'm basically working very closely with our research and insights team to be able to have a pulse into what's happening in the world today. Awesome, and Wanda, do you wanna introduce yourself to our attendees? Sure, hi, I'm Wanda Pogue. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at VaynerMedia based in New York. And like wow. everyone else right now, based out of my home. <laughs> Your home looks lovely. Um, well, thank you. Thank you both for joining me. I guess maybe the best way to start this conversation would be to just talk about your initial reactions to some of the Persky data that we just went over. I mean, for me at least, um, you know, as a millennial, I am uh, one of the women who's downloaded video games and playing them more than usual. I'm playing The Sims again which I don't know if anyone else is, but I am. What about you guys? Any initial reactions? Well, for myself, I, um, I think the data is very intuitive and makes a lot of sense based on what we're all experiencing. I think that we've, if we're to look at this data on a week to by week basis, we may see some changes. I think that we're all going through a collective uh, kind of like a grieving process. So every week uh, it's something different, a completely different experience for us. But I really could resonate, a lot of the data resonated with me, with me, particularly about what kind of messages we wanna see at this time. I think that a lot of us would love for brands to be uh, understanding of what's going on, to not pretend like nothing's happening and really be uh, a service for a lot of the people that need it at this point. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think a lot of it felt very intuitive um, as not a millennial, but a parent of two Gen Zers, you know, I see a lot of the behavior that was kind of shared in the data as well. Um, I think that there were some things that, that were a little surprising, you know, the 48% um, of people that, you know, want brands to reach out and communicate with them. I thought that that was actually higher than what I was, you know, would have expected. Because I think a lot of us believe that maybe there's some fatigue because so many brands have actually started messaging during this time. Um, love the fact that the data kind of reinforced, you know, the brands, the way that brands should be communicating, you know, by supporting, showing empathy, understanding, you know, kind of being there for them. Um, so that directive I thought was also really helpful so that marketers know not just to not go dark, but you know, what types of messages they can actually put into market that would be the most relevant right now. And then I think the, the other thing you know, for me and for all of us to kind of be mindful of is that while the numbers are very similar for Gen Z and millennial, these are two very different generations. So while their needs may seem the same on the surface, I think it's important to understand that there's many life stages between these two generations and the way that, you know, that things manifest may be very different and the behaviors. So the numbers may be the same, but the behaviors and the actions that they are taking may be a little bit different. So I think we just need to be mindful of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. At some point, we have to get past using millennials as a synonym for just young people. Because <laughs> yeah, it's not it's exactly not at this point. Um, so is there an example of a, of a marketer that has been able to respond to this crisis in their marketing that, you know, you, you think is a, is a good example of, you know, being able to, you know, say something about what's going on and also, you know, um, not, not be dark during this time? I personally see a lot of marketers taking an amazing approach when it comes to the current crisis. We see a group of marketers that are taking more of a, we're taking care of our customers kind of messaging, or we have the, prob the products that you need and we have them available for you. Uh, we also see a lot of people taking the approach of, you know, we're giving back and definitely taking care of the community. So there are some really great examples. I really love uh, what the did in terms of putting a new face on real beauty and saluting the healthcare workers. I thought that that was something that was very thoughtful. And I think that the brands that do it best are those who are utilizing their current, you know, their existing strategy and expanding it to be relevant and, and, and being useful during this time, as opposed to a brand that is doing something completely out of the norm. And it sometimes appears as a little inauthentic when you do that. Um, other brands that I, that I really connect with are those who are, um, definitely putting themselves out there. I really love the AT&T example. Recently, they are they decided to give away three months free of service um, to nurses and physicians. And that's something that, you know, it, it's very relevant to their business, but it's also very charitable. So uh, lots of brands doing great things out there. Yeah. yeah. I think I've been most inspired um, by brands who have completely pivoted you know, from their day-to-day -day output to, you know, whether it's, you know, making gowns for healthcare workers or, you know, turning their distilleries to, you know, hand sanitizer um, or, you know, creating masks for people. I think um, those have been really great examples of this isn't the time maybe to do our mass production. This is a time to really be helping people in need. And I think that consumers will reward brands that take actions like that. You know, um, I think when this is all done, you know, and, 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 and maybe it won't be all done, but I think a lot of people will look back and ask, what did you do during this time? And, and what was your role during this time? And um, particularly for Gen Z, I think that the actions that brands take right now um, are important. Absolutely. It seems like a very tricky balance and one that, you know, can't be easy to make those decisions. Um, I think one example that we've seen that kind of went viral of a, um, a brand talking t about the pandemic on, on social was that Stakeums uh, Twitter thread. I don't know if you, if either of you ended up seeing, but it was like this Stakeums thread talking about capitalism and what it means for, uh, for this pandemic. And it was just, it was an unexpected message from like a meat product. Um, so I guess I, I just mentioned that to ask you guys, like, what are some of the best practices to connect with millennials and Gen Z on social right now? Because, you know, so much of the, of the conversation is happening there. I think that first and foremost, it's really important for brands to take a step back and really understand what each of these generations are going through, both millennials and Gen Z. Um, like Wanda mentioned, they're very completely different audiences going to completely different things. So, for instance, a millennial, you know, this is not the first time that we've experienced something um, that is, you know, it's, it's very defining of our generation from 9-11 to the recession to now. Uh, every stage of our lives has been defined by something that has been very impactful. So add to that the fact that, you know, like you mentioned, Christina, you know, many times people look at us millennials and think that we're still kids, but a lot of, you know, the oldest millennial is in the 40s. So uh, at this point in time, we're responsible for not only our children, but also our parents. Uh, we're the glue that ties it all together. So in terms of engagement, I could see how a millennial is looking for that reassurance, that message that's going to make them feel like, the, like a brand cares about them, what they're going through. Uh, so engagement in social should be, should have a tonality that's a little bit more caring. 
um, understanding what they're going through. And then for a Gen Z audience, you know, for this particular group, you know, their life has been completely interrupted. You know, they're coming of age, a lot of them, um, a lot of the rites of passages that they had, you know, planned have been completely interrupted from graduations to prom to music performances to their friends. So a message that's very heavy and very emotional may not be fully relevant for them, mainly because this is a generation that's very anxious. So for the most part, they're probably going to be looking for ways to escape. Uh, for ways to feel positive, to really um, get away from what's happening. So when we think about our engagement on social, whether it's social or on digital or even on TV, um, thinking about what balance do we strike between being very emotional and very caring versus being, you know, providing some, something positive and some sort of distraction for those people that, you know, don't want to be bombarded with COVID messages uh, for their entire day. Yeah. Completely agree. I think that it's important for us to kind of look at each generation, but then within the generation, there are different cohorts. And if, if the intent is to drive relevance, I think we really need to be mindful that there's a whole host of needs, mindsets, and even within different needs, you know, there's times that people want diversion. There's times that people want empathy and utility. There's one, times that people want inspiration. You know, so I think um, we need to kind of be mindful of both. I think to, to your point, fully agree, you know, um, when you look at Gen Z, you have, you know, part of them who, you know, think of the class of 2020, whether that class was just ready to graduate high school or what, whether they were just ready to graduate college. Right now, their life is a little bit in limbo. You know, big monumental, you know, milestones have been postponed. Some of them have been canceled. You know, there are kids who, you know, have had their internships um, revoked, you know, job searches are going to be put on hold because the economy may end up going into recession. So I think um, being mindful, God bless you, <laughs> um, of all of those things is going to be critically important um, so that brands can kind of A, find their role. Um, ensure that they have the right tone, that they appear in the right places. And then as you look at millennials, you know, I, I mean, a lot of them are homeschooling right now, you know, so some of the platforms that they're turning to and some of the, you know, the most useful sources are things like Khan Academy and, you know, um, helping them to be able to school, you know, their own children. So I think we just, we need to be mindful as marketers of the mindset and the life stage that people are in. Um, so we can kind of adapt our messages and be able to drive greater relevance. Yeah, I think, you know, one, one of the things that Persky mentioned in the data is, you know, people doing these classes at home and, you know, maybe doing a Skillshare or, or a masterclass or something like that. But then you see, um, like, clearly everyone's getting inundated with masterclass ads because we wouldn't have that SNL sketch, sketch from this past weekend without that. So I, I do think it's like, you have to recognize the changing behavior uh, and, um, you know, be mindful of, of how that appears. Um, so I guess one of the other things we should probably talk about is, you know, what do you see as the biggest change to consumer purchasing habits, um, you know, after all of this? <laughs> I don't know if, if that's, if you can make a definitive <laughs> answer at this moment, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's two ways to look at it and, and the data um, that Jamie and Nadia shared kind of hint to it, you know, I mean, I think people are substituting right now, whether, um, you know, and brand loyalty is something that I think is, is, you know, questionable, you know, whether that, whether people are reconsidering the brands that they buy because of out of stock, um, because of financial constraints, you know, a lot of those, what we had seen in 2008 is that a lot of times you switch brands and you'll stay with the other brand because good is good enough, you know, and, and you realize that the compromises that you made in switching brands isn't necessarily that big of a deal. However, I also think to the point um, that we were discussing before, this is a time where you want brands that feel like are in line with your values and that are really stepping up right now. So I think, um, you know, and Nadia mentioned it, this is an opportunity for brands to drive trial, you know, because people are a lot more open, a lot more receptive, and a lot more willing to give new things a try. 
I also think that it's a time for brands to kind of declare what they want to stand for. And, and this is a time where doing good is good and it is rewarded because people will remember the actions that you've taken. And this is a brand that I want to align myself with. I think I read a study um, not too long ago that was done globally, you know, that 71% of people will not go back to brands that don't behave in the proper, you know, manner right now that don't do their part. And, you know, a good portion of people are really expecting brands to step up because they feel that brands can fill the void of government, you know, so they're looking to brands to kind of do and take action. And I think that there will be, you know, some loyalty expressed um, as a result of that. I completely agree. And I think that in addition to all of those behaviors and that emotional connection that brands need to ensure they, that they, they develop during this time or then they need to ensure that they don't lose. Um, a lot of the behavior shifts are going to happen as a result of this little bit of a trial that's taking place right now with consumers. So similar to how they're trying different brands, they're also trying behaviors that might have not been very natural for them. So I'm, I'm the exception. I'm an online shop shopaholic, but for some people that's not the case. So they, they, they're leaning on these types of whether it's online shopping or curbside pickup um, because of the need. And as a result, they're going to start getting used to that. And that's going to be more of an expectation for them moving forward. There are other behaviors such as, you know, consuming less or, or really appreciating the value of what you have. So we certainly see consumers um, for the fact that they're trying more products today, they're going to be a little bit more, uh, have higher expectations of brands for what they're offering. I think the other thing, Christina, to be mindful of is that the same way that there were stages, you know, to, to lockdown and sheltering in place, I think that there are going to be stages to, you know, whether you say, you know, the lift of the lockdown or, you know, getting back out there, I think that there are going to be stages to that as well. You know, so I think we'll see like some, some anxiety in the beginning and the, and the desire to kind of safeguard. So the same surge that we saw, like when, when we went into lockdown of hand sanitizers, gloves, masks, I think people are going to try to safeguard, you know, so we'll see some consumer behavior there. And I think as we move forward, there will also be a sense of preparedness, you know, a desire for preparedness, you know, and um, how prepared am I going to be for the next pandemic? Because there's a feeling that this is not one and done, you know, and, um, that I need to make sure my, you know, broadband, you know, that I have my, all of the things I need to be able to work from home, that the comfort of my home is what I need it to be if, you know, the next time that I have to spend, you know, four weeks at home. So I think we'll, it's important for us to kind of look at it in stages, you know, and, and I think it's um, easier for brands to be then able to play a credible role within each of those stages. I think I might have seen somewhere that, um, you know, we, we've exited the toilet paper hoarding phase and now we're hoarding um, <laughs> hair dyes and products. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all seeing the change. So yeah, I really agree with this. You know, we certainly can't predict the, predict the future. Um, there are some things that we can foresee, but there are things that are going to definitely surprise us as we go through it. Uh, one thing that for a fact I see um, is this expectation for in-store, the in-store experience is probably going to have to change. You know, people are going to expect a more clean and organized experience um, just for the fact that we're not going to automatically go from where we are now to complete normality. Um, there's going to be a transition period of people needing or expecting a certain level of service when they go in-store. Um, and, and I certainly agree with the need to be more prepared. You know, I think that a lot of us were living week by week in terms of our purchases. Now, you know, bulk buying may be something that's done across the board a little bit more than it used to be. Yeah. Okay. And I guess one of the other things we should touch on is like, all right, so there was this period of time where brands were like, no, we're not going to market. We're going to press pause. We need to, we need to figure it out. And a bunch of marketers are still in, in that space right now. Um, you know, they'll, they'll probably plan to ramp up again in, in Q3, but 
others have been able to respond and you know have these have these messages that touch on what's happening now. But do you, do you guys think there's like too much talk of, of, of coronavirus in marketing that's happening in the space right now? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that was the data point that kind of surprised me the most because as a marketer, I was like, maybe, maybe enough is enough, you know, and people need to hear something different. So the 48% that Nadia and Jamie shared um, was surprising to me that so many are willing and open and expecting brands. Um, I, I think the most important thing, you know, if, if I were to give advice to any marketers is listening right now is really imperative and important. You have to listen to consumers and kind of, because the pulse changes, you know, week by week as people are experiencing, you know, whether it's lockdown or moving from lockdown into, into be able to go out again. Um, I think that community management is critically important in terms of what are consumers telling you that they need and brands need to really be responsive, you know, but to all the points that, that were made earlier, you know, it's about how can you be of utility? How can you offer support? How can you help inspire? How can you help people stay motivated? How can you allow people to be creative with their resources? You know, so there's a, a role, many roles that a brand can play, when to play them, when to push, you know, what the brand offers, all of that needs to be taken into account. And I think that the bullshit meter is super key. You know, we brands need to be authentic. And they need to seem like they actually care and that they're not in it just for profit. Absolutely. Uh, there needs to be a balance. I think it's all about balance. You know, at some point, the message that you put out this week about you supporting, you know, healthcare workers may not have as much of a longevity. And, and I think that's fine. Um, you don't want to spend three months talking about how you did something great. You know, that's when the authenticity of a message can go down. Um, so it's really listening, it's really paying attention to the needs as they happen week by week. Um, and also providing a balance between, you know, you know, utility, charitable messaging, as well as just messages that are going to distract us from what's happening. You know, it, it's really refreshing when I see something that's different and it's funny and it's, it's unique. I think that's why a lot of us are gravitating towards, you know, music and gravitating towards streaming, you know, shows that are not very informative, you know, so, uh, we all need an escape and, and anything that can make people feel like you're being true uh, and authentic, but also providing an escape, I think, will be something that could benefit everyone. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what two, two things that people kind of need right now, a sense of small victories, you know, like not everything is against you. So I think brands that can help you feel like, you know, a small victory is possible. Um, we work on Scott's Miracle Grow, and you know that's. I, I think that planting a garden, you know, even if it's a small garden, and being able to see the fruits of that labor um, are are important for people. I think helping people feel productive is also important because you know when you're sheltering in place, and if you're not as motivated as Nadia, and you're not taking up violin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lessons like it, it's um it's hard to feel like you're productive. So helping people feel a sense of productivity, I think, is important. And simplicity. There's so much stuff that's just confusing for people, and so much in the news. And I think this is a time for brands to just keep it simple. You know what? You know, keep your RTBs to yourself. You know, just make it easy for people to purchase, to understand, to process. Got it. Thank you, Wanda and Nydia. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to keep you guys on, but I'm going to invite Jamie and uh, Nadia to come back on if they want to pop on their videos um, so that we can answer some of the questions that have come in. I think the, the first one I want to um, ask you guys is, there is a question, um, the future intended uh, switching behavior really stood out in, in the data for one of our um, attendees. And so they're wondering to what degree do you feel loyalty is a factor here from consumers, you know, paying back those brand, brands that were there for them during this time. So, you know, I can start with that and maybe Jamie can jump in. Thanks, Christina. And love, love that panel. I love the idea of the little victories, the small wins. I mean, to be fair, the violin 
has not lasted that long. So <laughs> I've learned very quickly that I'm horrendous at it. Um, <laughs> I basically had this uh, old violin from when I was a kid um, and thought I would take it up again, but it, it's, it's not working too well, but it's the little things, right? The little wins. Um, so to answer uh, this question from, I think I'm pronouncing it, um, Dane Jensen, uh, I think that loyalty is, is interesting from the standpoint of, you know, the, the reason why consumers were saying that they were, were performing brand switching was primarily due to lack of availability. I think for one, it's, it's just, it's very hard to be loyal if you, you can't access the brands that you want, want to access. I do think that um, how a consumer might define brands who were there for them during this time, I think that those who build loyalty now will see customer retention in the future. I know for sure I will. I actually discovered a really interesting insight um, through, through one of our studies where um, we actually discovered that uh, it was very common for consumers to say, what are these brands doing for me? I'm very glad that they're doing things for everyone else and I'm glad that they're helping healthcare workers, but I'm also struggling because I also got laid off or got my hours reduced or, or you know, um, got, a, got a salary reduction. What, what about me? What are these brands doing for me? Um, I think that's a really interesting statement. I think during times of fear, people retreat to what they, what they know, what gives them comfort and stability and some, some sense of, of continuity of normal life. Um, so I think the answer to that is, is I think loyalty is a huge factor, factor during this time, as in um, loyalty can be built now and will continue to be shown later. I think it will have the reverse for those who had loyalty to other brands prior. Because for the ones that they had prior, they're like, well, I'm not seeing anything anymore. And I don't think this brand weighed in at all. And this other brand came in with a great product that I like, um, serves my needs, and really feels like they were there for me, or they talked to me, they communicated with me. They gave me some form of comfort during this time. I think that is where you will see loyalty. Makes sense. Um, one other question that we had come in was about the death of the influencer. There's been a, a, a heated debate about whether or not influencers are, you know, uh, needed or not during this time period. In, in my reporting, I've heard from a couple of influencer agencies that, you know, without without brands being able to, you know, work with, um, you know, top tier talent at this moment and, you know, uh, in, in traditional shoots that, you know, influencers who are accustomed to shooting things in their home are actually something that they might rely more on. But, you know, take that with a grain of salt. It was an influencer agency who was telling me that. So we'd love to hear what you guys think, death of influencer or not. I think it really depends on the type of influencer. Uh, I definitely am a high influencer consum consumer and, and follower. Um, there are some that you know have created a career out of being informative. So a lot of a lot of that has not changed. Uh, but those who have made a career out of you know uh, what we call flexing and, and showing how great your life is, they're definitely struggling because I, I think that any message that shows that will come out across as inauthentic. Um, I don't think that influencer marketing is dead. I think that it's going to shift. And authenticity is something that has been lost for a very long time. You know, there's always this facade that people put on social media. It, it's going to shift. Um, people, need, people are going to recognize what's real and what's not. Yeah, I, that makes sense. I, I was also going to add, um, what's really interesting is I, I saw a lot of talk on, on social media. So there was... Um, you know, I was, I was early on, earlier on in the, in the lockdown, I was noticing some comments and I just saw people being like, you know, seeing these influencers posting like bikini photos from a vacation they took like maybe six months ago. And the comments were just like, no one cares. People are dying. Like they were really, like these people were just re responding in this way. And I think that speaks to what Nidia says in terms of, you know, authenticity. It's just like, you know, everyone's thinking about their health right now and their loved ones and their families and their communities. I think the type of content that some influencers have been putting forth just isn't going to fly anymore. I think people are really starting to, to think about it during this time and realize what is actually important to me. That has been a, a trending theme across all, across all the social channels I've seen. Um, whether or not that persists is a completely different story. I don't know, we'll have to see. Maybe things will go back to normal in six months and it'll be back to you know cool 
cool photos from the Seychelles, <laughs> who knows? Um, but in the interim, I, I do think that there is some sort of, uh, you know, rejection of some, some type of, that type of influence. I also think I saw that with um, Women's Wear Daily posted a, a ad, uh, their, like content around the low rise jeans and how that's the new trend and having uh, someone wearing them. And people just went to town on this post on Instagram, just being like, we're coming out of quarantine. Do you know how much we've been snacking? Like no one's gonna be wearing these low rise jeans. And then people started banding together and then women started being like, let's all band together and shut down the low rise jeans trend. So I think it's, I, I do think it's interesting. Um, I, I do, I'm gonna wanna see how, how it evolves. We also see the rise of new influencers and, and influence, the definition of an influencer is shifting. Uh, we see broadcasters borrowing from the influencer, YouTuber, uh, production mindset and applying that to the way that they do their work. Um, and, and there's a lot of skills that they have to learn from that aspect because there's com the digital world and the broadcast world are completely different on how you show up. But we also see musicians, you know, really stepping up and, and providing experiences for people uh, and, and becoming the new influencer. You know, we see creativity being up significantly. Um, even though we don't want to see your pictures from your latest vacation, we do want to see you take, partaking on these challenges and, and dances and, 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 and things that bring people together. So there's an aspect of social media that in the past used to be more, uh, you, you were just witnessing social media. Now people are really participating and coming together um, through a lot of the actions that they take. For sure. Um, do you guys see TikTok coming of age during this time? I see TikTok becoming more mainstream. I, I, you see a lot of the TikTok challenges and behaviors translating to other platforms and therefore becoming, driving more awareness of what's going on. So um, it's something that's just gonna continue to happen. And, and I think that the success of, of what happens on TikTok is because of that ability to bring people together. It's not just about you, it's about what everyone is doing. Yeah, I, I think it's um it's just a great forum for escape and you see Gen Z, you know, gravitating to it, I think because of that, you know, it's light, it's fun, it's um it's all inclusive, anyone can participate in it, you know, and um I think you'll also see and we're already seeing the rise of it with other generations as well, with a lot more millennials joining the platform. So I think um for sure. And, and brands are experimenting, you know, I think um, whether they're doing challenges or, or you know, what have you, um, I think the time for it is now. For sure. Okay. Um, I'll ask you guys one more question from our uh, attendees, which is, uh, do you think once a brand addresses the issues and supports communities that they'll be able to pivot back to content that their community is craving? Like, is there a threshold before a brand is able to green light going back to normal or, you know, having more lighthearted content? I think there's some uh, evidence to say that lighthearted content could even be uh, acceptable right now. I mean, we had, we, I, we didn't focus on the bottom of those scales a lot, but there was 23% of people saying that I I'd just like to be entertained right now. Um, so I, I think Wanda touched on this as well and saying that there, there's some balance to be achieved there. So certainly the people want the situation they're dressed, but there's also those that just want some more lighthearted fun. And I think brands can help build relationships and loyalty by, by contributing there too. Yeah, I think there's a difference, you know, so fully agree with Jamie. And I think that there's a difference between lighthearted and tone deaf, you know, so um, being insensitive isn't going to work, you know, but being lighthearted and bringing a dose of, of levity to people's lives, I think is, is welcomed now, you know, if done tastefully and will certainly be welcomed as we move forward. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. I think that's a good note to end um, our Q&A on. And I would love to turn it over to Gina for some closing remarks. Thank you. So I just want to say what an insightful panel. Um, I think, you know, hearing about um, this is a time for brands to declare what they stand for and that doing good is going to get rewarded. I think the biggest takeaway for me um, is just everybody's openness to new things. And so I think this is all positive in what feels like um, 
a tough time, but I think we're all going to get through it, thankfully. Um, I encourage everyone to stay safe and productive. And um, until the next time, the iClub is here for you.